One second. Technical difficulties. Maybe I wasn't supposed to ignore it. Oh, it's interesting too. Okay. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, uh, Afraid of the feedback. Uh, thank you all for having me here. Uh, this is my first uh, Santa Cruz Galaxy workshop. So again, I'm Matt Orr. I'm a fifth year, uh, about to be fifth year grad student down at Caltech, uh, working with uh, Phil Hopkins. And this project, I was also collaborating with Chris Hayward out of the CCA. So as we've heard a lot about in the last hour and a half, um, feedback does stuff in galaxies. And I'm going to add on that with a simple model. Although I'm a fire person, I'm not strictly speaking going to be talking much about fire today. but if you have questions, I'm in the back. So um, again, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about lately is the scatter and the kinetic schmidt relation. Because as we've been trying to predict a bunch in the last couple of years, why do we get the kinetic schmidt relation in the first place from a self-regulated regime? Avishai talked a bunch about it, how we might even not need gravity to tell us anything. But uh, one of the things I've thought has been very interesting is that you know, even if there's no questions about how XCO does anything and our ability to really tell us how much gas there is turning into stars, we still have you know, about a DEXA scatter most of the way along the reasonable part of the Kennecke schmidt relation before we have galaxies that are just exploding everywhere in their centers. And the picture doesn't get much better even if we're just looking at Kennecke schmidt in the molecular version, although the slope turns into a nice flat our flat um, linear law, as uh, Vadim was talking about earlier. Um, but we're still stuck with this idea that, you know, we have maybe about a dex scattered, and that's perhaps not being fair to um, Leroy here, but there's still about half a dex or so of scatter in the Kennedy Schmidt relation. So for a given amount of gas, it's anyone's uh, guess as to how much star formation is happening within some reasonable uh, limits. So when we're talking about how regulation, if we're in a feedback regulated picture, we're balancing two things, so to speak. We're balancing, if we're in a turbulently regulated regime, we have the momentum injection from young stars um, and the dissipation of it. Uh, is that better? I, I can't hear so well up here. So the momentum injection from young stars and its dissipation and turbulence uh, in the ISM at the disk scale or whatever your favorite scale length is. So a number of people have worked out uh, what this scaling should be, roughly speaking. And I did it in a paper where we were looking in fire if we got Kennecke Schmidt out. Uh, and you can write it a couple of ways. And you more or less get one of the same pictures. You have something that cares about the external potential of your galaxy, you know, your scale heights and scale lengths in the galaxy itself. You have feedback strength. When there, you might jam in your metallicity dependence on you know, where radiation matters and turbulence um, peters out from supernova injection. And then you have the actual fuel for star formation itself, the amount of gas present. And you might care about the stellar potential locally as well for how high your gas flies. Now, all this to say uh, is how much do variations in these quantities within galaxies give us our scatter? Would we expect there to be enough of a scatter in your metallicities, in the strength of your feedback across galaxies, in your local gas fractions, that you get out this half a dex of scatter or a dex of scatter, depending, as you march from your outskirts down into your central molecular zones. Um, now, in fire, we looked at this a little bit, where we took you know, our fire galaxies, or uh, Milky Way analogs, and I asked, you know, in KPC patches of it, if I can forward predict from their metallicities, their gas fractions, their uh, gas scale heights, what the expectation value is for our 10 mega year average star formation rates, and compare it to a you know, an observed 10 mega year star formation rate, we have a whole lot of scatter. The expectation values fall up to a dex or two away from where we ought to, where we think the star formation ought to be. And so it's kind of interesting that across the range of gas surface densities in at least the fire simulations, that we have this broad scatter where the equilibrium values aren't, strictly speaking, doing a very good job of predicting the star formation rates we see. 
Now, that's not necessarily a problem if I've done a bad job guessing what the star formation rates are. But I think one of the telling interesting things is that if we were to look at a single galaxy and take a bunch of closely related snapshots and look at how our kil kiloparsec average kennedy schmidt relation goes, it dances around even at late times. It's a little small, but it's redshift very near zero. So you know, as Vadim was showing, gas in the star forming phases seems to not like being in a star forming phase. So feedback blows it out into some other phase. And so we have a lot of you know, our data, although the locus is fairly well concentrated, it still dances around for you know, redshift of 0.1 on down where our things are next. Now, uh, this is a shameless plug that I'm looking to see if this isn't just me doing a bad job guessing how much gas is there compared to what observers would see. So we're trying to now model out CO and C plus uh, masses and emission in the fire galaxies. So if you're interested, talk to me later. Um, now, how do I talk about where this scatter comes from in the remaining five minutes that I have? Um, here is a simple model. We have a slab of gas in the, say, a Milky Way or a disk potential uh, that has some scale height that cares about the external potential and the disk's self-gravity uh, that cares about the amount of velocity dispersion in there, plus a little thermal factor. Uh, now, the stability of it is a modified tumor cube parameter, something that cares a little bit about the stellar surface density. And uh, there is, thanks to this tumor cube and uh, some work that Phil did in 2013, we can think of what fraction of a disk is driven to, to have over densities that are sufficiently self-gravitating to be in a star-forming phase. So I'm imagining there is a um, star-forming phase of the galaxy, or of the patch of the galaxy, that has a free fall time that's the disk's crossing time, and it has some low efficiency of star formation. Uh, so principally in this model, we're evolving how the velocity dispersions um, behave. Now, here, we're not allowing the velocity dispersions to be, strictly speaking, in equilibrium, where they're just stuck right at the equilibrium value. So we have to evolve them by some equation. Now here, there are roughly three parts to it, the details of which are I don't have enough time to talk about. But effectively, the three parts are there's supernova turbulence, which is injected after some delay time, because you got to wait a little while to get your dividends. Your most massive stars still have a lifetime of a few million years. And the Injection lasts for you know, 30 or 40 million years until your you know, 10 solar mass stars finally explode. There's some prompt feedback in terms of winds and radiation pressure. And finally, star formation uh, or turbulence is running down exponentially as supersonic turbulence is ought to do. Um, now, it's something we've known for a while is that the winds and radiation pressure itself, except for perhaps in the densest environments of the cores of galaxies, uh, aren't enough to do the job. Uh, the, it's too weak compared to uh, supernova. So really, we expect that the, this delayed injection of feedback is what's going to be helping us set the scatter. So if you're an uh, atom in the ISM, or maybe you have some friends and you're a molecule, uh, you might expect to find yourself somewhere in a gas cycle, so to speak. You're either in part of the phase where your gravity is winning and it's collapsing and turning into stars, or maybe feedback's turned on, your clouds are dispersing, and you're back out in the ISM, and then you wait for cloud, cloud collisions or pick your favorite way of bringing gas back together, plus gravity. Now here, again, for this model, there's principally two parts to it. There's part where the turbulence is decaying and running down and feedback isn't giving you any help. And then there's part where the feedback is ejecting turbulence and it's running back up. Now, the, the fact that there's some period where these don't quite overlap, where you have stars but no feedback, um, that's where I think the scatter is coming from. So put all this together and integrate it using your favorite MATLAB or Python, Python 2 or 3 script. And you can get these stable oscillations and star formation that are about a dex. So here, again, it's depletion times of around a giga year, but scatter up and down a little bit. And tumor cube hardly moves, because as you dip into the star formation phase, on average, the galaxy pushes you back out in these disk scale height size patches. Now, if you try to make fake kennedy schmidt uh, plots out of this, or look at depletion time versus tumor cube, you see some very interesting things. Uh, the principle import, principally of importance is that your delay time, the longer your delay time, the further you're able to drive from equilibrium. So short delay times, you lock right onto putting in the, just the right amount of turbulence that you need to regulate your galaxy. But if you wait a little bit and overshoot, you can drive decks or more scatter in kennedy schmidt um, In the background is the Frank McGill plot that everyone loves to look at. Uh, now, here, the interesting thing is that tumor cube doesn't really help you very much in terms of predicting what's going on because there's so much stirring going on and the, the phase between your star formation is changing as you march across surface densities in your galaxy. So 
things like uh, what Adam Leroy has looked at in 2008, 2013, they don't help you as much. Uh, Tumor Q doesn't help you as much, I don't think, in predicting instantaneously what your galaxy ought to be doing. Um, the picture doesn't change too much more depending on what your uh, efficiencies are in terms of small scale efficiencies, as long as you don't choke it too much uh, or pick weird tumor cues. Um, and yeah, so I hope I didn't run out of time. But anyways, the summary I would declare is that uh, the scatter in Kennecke Schmidt, I don't think, uh, is described by variations in a galaxy that are in a static equilibrium, so to speak, between balancing uh, feedback and turbulence running down. Uh, but they might be in a dynamical equilibrium, where you have this overshoot that's coupled between the delay time scale of feedback being injected and the time it takes uh, you to run back down into that phase. So the fact that there is non-negligible time period between your feedback injection and your star formation, I think, makes all the difference. And tumor Q might not help you very much in predicting, uh, strictly speaking, your star formation rates. Uh, thank you very much. Questions? That's a nice description of what might be causing the scatter in the local relation. Mm -hmm. Could you make some comments about which of that picture might carry over, if any, into talking about the scatter in the global relation? So in the global relation, I think it's a matter of averaging out like regions and Depending on the slope of your, the Kennecott power law that you get out of it, uh, if it's sufficiently steep, it might, you know, your central, the central parts of your galaxy might matter more um, rather than your outskirts because if you're just dominated by the amount of star formation in the, uh, the central few kiloparsecs. So I think that um, averaging, you're going to drive closer to equilibrium. So by averaging, you're averaging in time and hopefully like patches. And so Presumably, we would hopefully be getting closer to um, you know, the equilibrium value there, that you just have enough patches going through their cycles and phase space that you might get right in the middle of it. Hopefully, that's not an unphysical state if you, know, you were actually avoiding it in phase space, but it all averages out. Anyone else? If not, let's thank all the speakers.